Let me say this, Vincenzo Calla, come on down. You got to get one of those in, right? Hey everyone, Vincenzo Calla here with Calla Productions. Today I'm sitting here with a very special guest, Rich Field, a meteorologist, radio host, author, and game show announcer. Best known for his time on The Price is Right, as well as an announcer for Real Fortune and many other game shows. Thanks, Rich, for your time, and thank you for joining me today. Oh, my pleasure. Let me say this, Vincenzo Calla, come on down. You got to get one of those in, right? That is like one of the biggest honors that's like the closest i've ever been to being on in my tv screen <laughs> that is absolutely an honor thank you rich so much uh, pleasure speaking. pleasure so uh so you're from canada right yeah i'm from ottawa the capital of canada and let me this tell is you, cool the price is right it's just as big up here as it is in the states i, I know that i know that from uh, the many years i worked at price and especially the years i worked with mr barker bob would always acknowledge uh canada and during commercial stop downs uh, if he had a canadian contestant or something he would he would talk at length about how popular the price is right was in canada and then, then he would give numbers and so on and so forth so he was very appreciative of the canadian audience well, it's, you know, it's, it's fantastic. Like um, recently, uh, before we get into the show, recently there was a contestant on The Price is Right who lost, he, there was a trip to uh, a city called New Westminster in British Columbia and he lost, but the city of New Westminster reached out and said, we have to find this guy. We're going to pay for him to come up here. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's that's, that's cool. Down. That's very Sorry. cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, so really cool. And yeah. So thank you so much for joining me. Welcome back to all the viewers. Welcome to all the new viewers tuning in to the show and let's get started. So, uh, Rich, I just wanted to to start off. Uh, I have your book. And Yay, I, I, all right, Vincenzo. <laughs> I'll autograph yeah. that for you if you want me to. Just send it to me and I'll autograph it, send it right back. For sure. That would that would be that would be fantastic. And you know, I've read some of it. I've I've watched your your interviews and podcasts before and you have quite the journey. You had quite the journey going to the prices, right? So I guess, first of all, um, I want to ask, when was the first time you knew you wanted to be Bob Barker's announcer on the prices, right? Really young, Vincenzo, really young. Um, people have tried to nail me down on it and, and I can't recollect like, you know, how old I was, but I mean, very young. I was mimicking Johnny and, 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 you know, I, my, we used to have videotape of me in Avon, Ohio with my mom's black hairbrush standing in front of the TV, really young kid, maybe 10, 11, you know, uh, it would have been 1972. So it would have been the new prices, right? So I'd have been 12 and I'm standing with my mom's black hairbrush in front of the TV going, come on down. How about a new car? So there was videotape of that at 12. But before that, I mean, I used to watch Bob on um, Truth or Consequences. I was a big fan of voices, really. So I, I love to watch shows because of the announcer's voice. Is this insane or what? But it's true. And I love the guy who did uh, Truth or Consequences. Truth or consequence, truth or consequences. I love that guy. And so I started watching the show and and I love this host, this young debonair guy, you know, Bob Barker, uh, black and white TV, you know, or early 60s. And then he gets prices right, full color models and high heels, you know, the whole nine yards. It was every young boy's uh, dream show. That's for sure. I mean, hot cars and girls. It was great. <laughs> so I, I was an immediate fan and I knew from a very early age that somehow I was going to work with him. Not, not that I, I mean, it wasn't, Hey, I want to work with Bob. It was more like, I know I'm going to work with Bob. Is that nuts? It's so, it's so cool. And, and you know, that, that like you, your, the, your title of the book is called trust your inner GPS. And I'm sure that was, was guiding you through all those years. And I want to talk about Johnny Olson. You met Johnny Olson. I did. Uh, so tell me a bit about that when you met Johnny Olson, when it was and what it was like. Well, like I like I said in the book, uh, uh, we were on a uh, family vacation. Well, what was left of the family, I had two bro brothers that went off to the Surface Academy. So it was my sister, myself, my mom, my dad. We went to a vacation in California and we happened to be eating lunch at Farmer's Market, which is right behind CBS Television City. I don't know if you've ever been there or not, but it's, they're, they're, they're right next to each other. And 
And um, my mom and sister had gotten up to go do some shopping and dad and I were left, you know, eating our sandwiches there. And, and I was looking out this window right next to me and I could see people like, you know, half a block away walking back into CBS. They were going through this, this large turnstile type gate that only one person could get through at a time. They would swipe their card and, and you know, it would open up. And I said to my dad, I said, oh, wow. I said, it looks like there's people coming back from lunch going back into CBS over there. And, you know, right there, you see the big CBS eye on the building and you see the huge Price is Right logo on the elephant doors, those mammoth doors that a semi can drive through. And so, you know, we knew Price is Right was there and my dad knew what a fan I was and everything. And and uh, he grabbed our wrappers. He said, come on, let's go. And I was like, where are we going? He's like, just, just follow me and hurry on. And so we ran up. We walked very swiftly up to the back of the line for the last person to have just gone through. But dad was there to, to try the this turnstile. And sure enough, it it had locked. And I thought, oh, you know, shoot, we're not going to get in. And, and But there was an intercom, Vincenzo, on the turnstile gate that said, uh, if you need help, you use use buzzer for the guard or something like that. I'm, I put in too many words, but uh, that's what it said. And so dad hit this buzzer and, and this disembodied voice came on. Can I help you? And my dad says, uh, "Yeah, I I forgot my uh, my pass, my 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 uh, ID. Can you buzz me in?" And the gate buzzed, and my dad grabbed me and he shoved me through the turnstile gate. And now I'm on CBS property, and he was locked out. But uh, as I mentioned in the book, not for long, because he buzzed the gate again, and the guard came back on. Yes, can I help you? And my dad says, "I I didn't get through the gate in time. Can you buzz me again?" And the gate buzzed again and my dad walked in and we walked right into CBS, right up the loading ramps, right past the commissary, right into the massive hallway. And there was all the prices, right? Games and the prizes and reveal model where the model stands next to the little reveals where they, you know, all that was there. They were getting ready to have a show. I could hear the music. I could hear people, you know, clapping and stuff, getting ready for this prices, right? Show. And, um, you know, I started messing around with my dad, saying, "Hey, Dad, how much do you think this refrigerator is?" And he'd be like, "Uh, four fifty. Oh, oh no, it was five five twenty, Dad. Sorry." And you know, even the car, I was like, "Dad, how much do you think this, you know, Chevy Chevette is or whatever?" You know, he's like fourteen thousand. Oh, oh, you know, I was screwing around like that. And from far at the end of this hallway, uh, this this guy yells out, "Hey, who are you two? And oh my God, I, I froze and my dad looked up and this guy came walking. He had a walkie talkie, looked very official, suit, tie, lanyards around him with all kinds of, you know, stage passes and stuff to get backstage of things. And and he says, who are you two and, and what are you doing back here? And my dad, you know, the king of uh, just snowing people and pretending like you're somebody and they don't even ask hardly, you know, most of the time. Um, he said, oh, he's with me. I'm just showing him around the prices, right? And, and the guy, first time ever in my life as a kid, somebody called my dad's bluff and he said, well, who are you? <laughs> and so the jig was up. My dad said, oh, we're, we're, we're just visitors. We, we came in through the back gate when people, when other, uh, employees were coming in and, and we saw the prices, right stuff. And the guy was like, oh my God, and he gets on the radio and he's, he's like, I need a price producer backstage right now. <laughs> I thought, oh, God, we're going to get arrested or something, you know. And uh, to make a long story short, uh, to keep the show and all its prizes um, safe from uh, any kind of, uh, you know, nefarious activity of us telling people, you know, they said, you know, you got to sequester these two. If you're going to if you're not going to change out the prizes in the games, You've got to sequester these two. You got to keep an eye on them so that we know that they're not cheating in the audience, you know. And uh, it was Kathy Greco, the associate producer, who would, who had come out into the hallway, and she she made the suggestion. Well, how about if we sit them off on the side of the stage, and uh, where the producers sit off stage, and and we watch them there. And the guy was like, "All right, if if you can do that and make sure they don't, you know, interact with the audience, fine." Well, she takes us back there. We meet Roger Dobkowitz. Roger's like, hey, it's way too busy back here, Kathy. This can't we'll put him in the back row right here. We can watch him there. You know, Roger's really cool. So they stuck my dad and I in the back row of the audience. I think the one thing that that the, that the gaming official that caught us didn't want to have happen happened. You know, they stuck us in the audience and, and uh, we knew we weren't supposed to participate or we weren't, you know, uh, I mean, we could yell and cheer and stuff like that, but uh that's that's really how I got in the audience to be able to meet Johnny Olson. And it was at that show 
that uh, he came out during his audience warm up and said uh, after it was over, it was a warm up was over and he was done doing his thing. He was like, well, are there any questions out there in the audience? And I raised my hand frantically and back. I said, yeah, Johnny, I got a question for you. How do I get your job? And the crowd just went crazy. They laughed. I mean, it was like a sitcom, Vincenzo. You know, you hear, you watch I Love Lucy, you hear that. Ha, 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 ha. That's what it sounded like, man. I, I, I kind of looked up to see, to see where that was coming from. And uh, Johnny said, oh, you think you can do my job, kid? Come on down. Johnny Olson called me to come on down. Come on down. Let's hear what you got. And man, it, Vincenzo, it was the fastest come on down you ever saw in your life. I, I'm surprised I wasn't doing somersaults rolling. It happened so fast. I got up on that stage and Johnny handed me the microphone. He said, use my name. Call me down to contestants row. Let's hear what you got. And so I took the mic. I said, Johnny Olson, come on down. You're the next contestant on The Price is Right. And the crowd went berserk. They went nuts. You know, I was a kid. I was I was maybe 18. I don't even know if I was old enough to be in there, frankly. 17, 18. Yeah. And um, probably just old enough to be in there. And, and, and that was it. That was my chance meeting with the legend, a guy that uh, I really looked up to him right then and there. I, was, I knew I was meeting greatness. I mean, Johnny at the time was the record holder for, you know, announcing the most game shows in a single season. He was Mark Goodson's guy, man. That, like, that is such a cool story. And, and I was thinking about that. You know, he did all the Goodson shows. Like, did he, do you know, did he work for Goodson, right? Like, yes. Whenever he did pilots, whenever there were pilots, like, I think he did the Family Feud pilot. He did, like, a pilot with, uh, with Alex Trebek for Double Dare. So yes. He, like, their go-to guy. Yes. Yeah. He, he was their staff announcer. He was their guy. And Mark Goodson loved Johnny Olson. And, and, and I know why. Johnny just had a quality, a happy tone to his voice. You know, come on down. I mean, he was just so good at it. And, and um, I mean, uh, just, a, just a huge loss when he did pass away. You know what I mean? Rod Roddy met Johnny Olson as well. Oh, did he? Like, he, yeah. wow. Before, so long before. You know, he ever became the announcer of The Price is Right. Rod Rod had a Rod has a, a meeting Johnny Olson story as well. So it's kind of cool that, you know, the first three guys, I mean, we all, you know, it's kind of kind of cool how we all met Johnny and got to interact and talk with Johnny. I mean, yeah. That is so cool. Like, what a history. Uh, before we go back to The Price is Right, I want to talk a bit about your time before The Price is Right. Um, working on specifically uh, CBS News as a meteorologist and, and your various different capacities on the radio. So what was what was it like to work as a meteorologist and work just generally on these CBS news stations? I know, you know, CBS is one of the big three networks. What was it like to work for CBS all those years? Uh, I, I loved it. I mean, as a kid, my dad built me a home weather station when I was just a kid. I mean, if there was two passions in my life, it was weather and the price is right. I mean, uh, and I was lucky enough to be able to do them both. I, I always thought as a kid, if I don't get into game shows and become, you know, get on TV like that, I want to be a weatherman someday. I was a caddy as a, as a as a young man at Avon Oaks Country Club in Avon, Ohio, and, and there was a, a a a member at the country club named Don Webster, and he was a very popular weatherman in Cleveland at the time, and and I knew my mom and dad watched him. I mean, before I ever caddied there, I, I watched him on TV, and then to see him and meet him and. And uh, I thought, wow, what a great life this guy has. You know, what a charmed life. You know, he's on a couple of minutes a night. And uh, just, you know, I thought, wow, what a really cool job. And so I always had an affinity for weather, number one, and 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 and, and thought, if I don't make in-game shows, someday I'll do that. Well, they kind of they kind of uh, intermeshed and intertwined. I used one to get the other, you know. I wasn't getting anywhere in radio. I mean, I shouldn't say that. I was at the top of the heap in radio. I was working at CBS FM on Sunset Boulevard for over 10 years. I mean, but I wasn't getting the breaks in, in television, auditions in television that I wanted to get for game shows. So I'd heard about Pat Sajak getting plucked off of KNBC out in Los Angeles. He was a weatherman out there. I'd heard about David Letterman uh, being a weatherman in Indiana prior to uh, his fame. I heard about a number of people from TV news that made the jump successfully into entertainment. And I thought, well, you know what? I'm going to do that. I'm going to go back to school. 
I'm going to I'm going to get my degree in meteorology and I'm going to come back out here to Los Angeles. I'm going to be a freaking number one nighttime weather man. And, and that's how I'm going to get noticed. And and when I do get into auditions, people are going to it'd be like Pat Sajak walking in, you know, the weatherman, Pat Sajak or whatever. And um, so I did. I I I. I, I, timing was right. After 10 years, I ended up being uh, let go at CBS FM on Sunset Boulevard. They went to a format that had no disc jockeys. I mean, I could, couldn't survive that. And um, I came back down here to Florida, started doing mornings on a radio station here in Florida, and I started taking meteorology courses through Mississippi State University uh, online. And um, you could complete so much of it online, then you had to go to the university, you know, and, and, and physically be there for some other lab courses and things like that. But uh, I started studying for meteorology. And soon as I did, I told an old agent buddy of mine, I said, look, I said, you know, find me a find me a weather job in Southern California so that I can be, if not seen by people in Los Angeles, then certainly be within close proximity of Hollywood so that I can still drive in and audition and stuff. And and uh, only a week or two went by and he called me up and he said, hey, look, I got a brand new CBS affiliate signing on in Palm Springs, California. And I knew where Palm Springs was. It's a bedroom community of Los Angeles. And and uh, everybody that's anybody, if you're a star in L.A., you also have a home in in, in the Coachella Valley in, in Palm Springs. And uh, I said, I'll take it. He was like, Palm Springs, Rich, it's, a, it's market number 133 in the country. You know, <laughs> I said, I'll take it. And he thought I was nuts. And I said, look, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to make the jump. I'm going to make the jump. He said, you're not going to make the jump from Palm Springs market 133 into Los Angeles, the number one media market in the freaking country. It's just not going to happen. And I said, uh, I said, I'm going to make it happen. You watch. And uh, it was during that time that I was in Palm Springs as a weatherman that Rod Roddy passed away. And that that opened the door for me to, to go ahead and start pursuing in earnest uh, an audition with Mr. Barker at the Price is Right, and and you made it. You made it there. Um, Crazy. In in two thousand and four, right? That's when you started. Rod passed away September of '03. Um, that was season thirty two. I came in just after the first of the year, and ended up uh, with the other auditioners. And then uh, as I did get the job, um, I think it was in March, officially announced in April, I ended up doing the last four months of season 32 of Rod's last season. So, yeah, that was that was early 04 that Mr. Barker hired me. He handpicked me. And, and what was that like um, that going on into your dream and, and being able to know? Bob Barker, Mr. Barker, the person. What was that like in working there and fulfilling your a, dream? A privilege and an honor. Um, in the book, I talk about some of my first taping days. And uh, I would, uh, you know, as the announcer of the show, you you not only had to do a 15-minute audience warm-up, you had to read all the copy during the show. Well, after the show, me and, a, me and a model would do like a giveaway, a prize giveaway to the audience, and then thank them all for coming. And I'd shake hands with audience members who wanted to meet me and stuff. And then I'd have to go back to my podium and do pickups. Uh, if I flubbed any line or messed anything up, or if they wanted to change any copy, they didn't like the way it was in the show. That was the time to re for me to re-record um, these lines. And so I, I remember the first day I got done with the first show and I had to do pickups. I got done with the pickups and, you know, you really focused, you're standing at the podium, you're not watching what's going around around you. And you, you got, a, you know, the associate director in your ear and He's upstairs in the booth. You got, uh, you know, uh, editing people downstairs, taking the tape and, and, you know, okay, Rich, turn to page three, paragraph four, you know, pick up at blank, you know, you flub the word excellence, uh, you know, get through that. Like, blah, 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 excellence. You know? And so I do all these pickups and, and um, I hear in my ear from the associate director, Fred Witten, okay, Rich, you're clear. And uh, so I, I took off my headphones and I set them down and, and it was the first time I really looked up from my podium and I was in, damn near pitch dark. Uh, the audience was gone. The pages were gone. The crew was gone. Certainly Bob was gone. The producers were all gone. The stage, the stage hands, everybody, it was, it was gone. The stage was empty. There were no games out there, nothing. It was, I was like, what the hell is there a bomb scare? You know, this is my very first audition day. So I wasn't, <laughs> I didn't know how things went. So, uh, yeah, there was no, there was no kind of critiquing of me or anything. Nobody gave me any notes 
you know, notes in Hollywood, it really means a critique. Rich, we have some notes for you. And that really means, hey, change this, do this, don't do that. And uh, but nobody had any notes for me. And it was perplexing, Vincenzo. I, you know, I I wanted to be perfect. I wanted to be perfect for them. Um, not so much just to get the job, but so that the shows that were going to go out on the air, even if I was auditioning, I wanted them to be perfect, you know. So it was a it was a ride. It was it was unbelievable to me to, to think that as a young boy that I'd always be working with Bob Barker and then to be standing there, you know, 30, 40 years later, just mind blowing 30 years later, just absolutely out of body, like another, I don't know if you believe in other realities, other realms. It was like, as if I, as I was standing there doing some of it, Vincenzo, I was like, I've done this before because as a young man, I, visualize or or maybe i did do it before i don't know it's so deep dude it's crazy it's just nuts it's so cool that that story is is so it's like I, your, your story it's it's fantastic i, I can't say much more because it's just amazing and and i guess um i want to talk a bit more about the price right and then i want to turn a bit to to some of the other work you've done but i guess on the price is right still while we're here um what was it like uh being able to personally know Bob Barker on a personal level and then a bit uh and then after that knowing the other staff on a personal level too like the the Barker's Beauties and then eventually Drew Carey what was that like uh first of all like I mentioned earlier Bob it, it just is it was just an absolute honor and he treated Christine and I my wife and I like 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 we were his his little children or something, you know, I was 40 something. And at the time, and Bob was nearly 80 when I got there, I think he was 80 when I got there. So Bob was 40 years older than me. Certainly, you know, we could have been his kids or even his kids, kids, frankly, but, um, he did, he treated like family. I should say he didn't treat us like children. He treated us like we were a part of his family. And I, and I could see that there was something special about that because, you know, as you're sitting there with Bob Barker in his kitchen, let's say, well, there's nobody else from The Price is Right around here. You know what I mean? As we're out to dinner with Bob, there, there was nobody else from the show hanging out. I knew Bob and Roger hung out a lot. Bob and Roger were best friends, literally. They Roger was Bob's best friend. I mean, it was a 35-year relationship there. And, and, and Bob was Roger's best friend, regardless of being boss and you know, producer, they were friends. They were best friends. So I knew Roger was friendly with Bob and I knew, or I thought maybe other producers were, but you know, as time went on, I mean, even after Bob left, you know, Christine and I still maintain a relationship with Mr. Barker as best we could. And uh, there still wasn't show people around. So it was, it was different. Bob took us in, man. He came to our wedding reception. I mean, Oh, just really personal stuff that that a guy doesn't do, you know, of his caliber. And 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 he even let that wedding reception in 04. I was told more than once, oh, uh, don't expect Barker. He he does not come to this stuff. They everybody called him Barker. Barker, Barker. And I always thought it was a little demeaning. I, you know, I I I had a hard time calling him anything but Mr. Barker, even to his face. I can remember, I can remember leaving CBS one of my first month or so and we're he and I are walking down the hallway together to our car. We parked next to each other. And, and I was like, oh, Mr. Barker, blah, blah, blah. And he said, hey, hey, Rich, it's it's been, you know, four weeks. Call me Bob. I said, absolutely, Mr. Barker, I will. And, uh, you know, I, I couldn't help but call it Mr. Barker. I, I had a hard time calling him Bob. But I did. He he. It might have been embarrassing for this guy to be constantly saying Mr. Barker, Mr. Barker, and and we were getting to know him better. So it, it, with time, it, it came it came to the point of Bob. Hey, Bob. Hey, Bob. Hey, Bob. Do you, can you, hey, hi, Bob. How you doing? You know, so then it came a little bit easier for me. But to anybody else on the show, during the show, during a rehearsal, after the show, outside of the show, it was always Mr. Barker. Even to this day, when I write about him, it's Mr. Barker. It's, it's like you worked with a legend like you worked with somebody who and and to be able to know you know that he was that close with you that is amazing to hear you know i'm i'm 
happy to hear your stories. Thank you for sharing your stories. It's fantastic. Uh, my pleasure. And, and, you know, meeting the models and getting to know them and, and, and Roger and Kathy and everybody else at the show. Uh, I can remember my first audition day coming into the green room. Uh, Kathy Greco uh, walked me from my dressing room to the green room. Oh, Bart Eskender did the director. I take that back. And he walked me into the green room for the first morning meeting of the day. And, and, uh, the three models stood up and I couldn't believe it. I mean, I, you know, I watched the show every day, most of my life. And, uh, here was, here was, uh, 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 Brandy, Brandy Sherwood. I mean, long time famous model, um, uh, Rachel Reynolds and, uh, Lanisha Cole. That was my first day. And I was just like, oh my God, <laughs> in my head, I'm flipping out. I'm trying to be, you know, relatively cool, you know, behind it all. I'm like, oh, hey, ladies, pleasure to meet you. And I watch you all the time. Yeah, blah, blah, blah. But inside I was like, oh my God, I can't believe it. <laughs> you know, there's Roger, there's Kathy, there's the models. This is insane, you know? And um, we start the meeting and we're going through the table read of the copy and the and the director's telling the models where to stand, what to do, when to do the reveals of the prices. And And, and Roger comes walking in and interrupts the meeting. And I see behind Roger is, is Mr. Barker. Again, my first day, first meeting. And Bob is, he's in, he's in, he, he had white tennis shoes on. He, he had blue jeans on. He had, he had a white shirt on that had blue and white, thin white stripes in it. I'll never forget. And he had his clothes and on his hook and his finger in one hand and a gym bag in the other. And, and, uh, then Roger come in and Bob followed behind him. And Roger says, excuse me, Bart, to the director. He says, uh, I just wanted to introduce Rich to the host of our show. This is, Bob Barker. And I and I thought first thing I thought in my head was, oh my God, the formality of it all, you know? And and then the second the second thing I thought was, well, hell yeah, that's Bob Barker. Who the heck who else is it, man? Well, you don't have to introduce Bob Barker to me. You know, this is Bob Barker. I was like, oh my God. I stood up from the table. I had to reach across the table and to shake his hand. And because Bob was already going in for a shake. And I was like, oh my God, Bob, pleasure to meet you. You know, thanks for having me today. And he says, Rich, you know, uh, welcome to The Price is Right. Uh, you'll have a splendid, I believe you'll have a splendid time with us today. Bob had a way with words, and he spoke a certain way. <laughs> and uh, I said, I just hope I don't screw it up, Mr. Barker. And, and he he has already, he's still got his clothes in one hand. And he picks up his gym bag, and he's turned and walked it out. As I say, I just hope I don't screw it up, Bob. He says, uh, don't worry if you do. Don't worry if you do. And he walked right out the door. And Bob saying that really took all the pressure off me, man. I thought, oh, God, here's the freaking man telling me don't even worry about it. We'll stop tape. We'll fix it. Don't sweat it. I was like, wow. That was my first meeting with Bob Barker. So, Rich, I just want to uh, continue on that point. And um, and we're going to transition. I have a few questions uh, about, about some of your other work and some of the other appearances you had. But what was it like um, in that transition between the Bob Barker era and the Drew Carey era, you were kind of the, you were the continuous voice. You were the voice of the price story. You continued on with that voice. What was that like uh, in that transition? And then those last few years that you worked with, with Drew uh, before you eventually left the show in, uh, you, you'll, you'll talk about that. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, there was a time where I spoke with my wife about leaving the price is right. When Mr. But once, once Bob came into my dressing room that uh, I think it was the day before Halloween, October, 30th of uh oh six i think it was uh he came into my dressing room and said to me hey hey rich you know uh i made a decision today i've already told les moon visit cbs i'm i'm gonna retire at the end of the season you know once that happened um i i had a lot of conversations with my wife about even staying at the price right i knew it'd be never be the show it was again if it flopped and failed i certainly didn't want to be a part of that um and I was there to work with Bob and I did it, you know, so I was completely fulfilled. I could have died a happy man right then and there. But um, CBS and Fremantle Media um, had a meeting with me up on the uh, third floor of CBS one day. And um, as bad as the meeting was for me and, and what I had to endure during that meeting in the end, I knew that they were uh, very interested in keeping me on. Uh, for another three years through the transition to Drew. And 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 you said it, it exactly right. You know, they're already changing out the host. Uh, they certainly didn't want to lose the 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 the, the pacing and the and, and the sound of the show. I mean that the announcer of that show is is integral. 
And uh, they did a lot of work to make sure their announcers not sounded alike, but uh, complimented the show the same way the last guy did. You know what I mean? And there was a certain way to announce it. The Price is Right. It wasn't like any other game show in the world. It was a little more effectuated, you know, um, instead of, you know, come on down. It was come on down. You know what I mean? There was a certain way to announce for Price is Right. And um, so staying on, you know, it was really... Uh, it was really a stroke to me to to hear CBS and Fremantle say you're integral, you know, in in the change over here, and we want you to stay. And they made it they certainly made it worthwhile, and and so I did. And then things fell apart three years later when when the new executive producer came in and started to dismantle the show. But nonetheless, I mean, I was happy uh, to stay on another three years uh, with Drew, and and it was, uh, <laughs> pardon me. It was uh, much. It was a much more lighthearted set with Drew. Um, Bob, you know, Bob ruled with an iron fist. I mean, not that he had to. You just knew that you didn't mess around during the Bob Barker era. I mean, my God, you know, it's Bob Barker. You know, you don't want to be acting a fool, you know, on the set, behind the stage, or nothing. You didn't, you know, and there's no pranks going on, no crap like that. But, but the Drew Carey era, oh, it was like it was like your high school, you know, college buddy. Uh, all of a sudden got the job and and that's the way drew wanted it he wanted everybody to feel you know accepted and loved and and he's really good about that really good about generous you know bob and drew are very generous people but in in completely different ways um where bob barker would give away a million dollars at a time in, in in grant form or donation form to colleges or universities to open up new law wings let's say for uh, animal rights lawyers believe it or not uh, Bob was huge on making new a new kind of law, animal rights law, and now, now it's everywhere. Now every law school in the country teaches animal rights law, and that's because of Bob. Uh, Drew was more um, Drew was more giving to the man on the street instead of a million dollars at a time to big universities or whatever. Bob was or Drew was more like you know a hundred dollars at a time to to the guy on the street. Drew would carry five grand in his pocket every day. And his mission in his head was to get rid of that money every day. And he was literally, he was, he was depressed if he got home and still had that money in his pocket or some of it in his pocket. And he'd give it away constantly all day, not to us on the set, not to people that worked there or anything like that. Although he helped people on the set quietly that we found out years later, you know what I mean? But um, it was more like, you know, if he and I went across the street to farmer's market and got a uh, Coke and, and fries, <clears throat> Drew would give the, the cashier a hundred dollar bill and tell her to keep the change. You know, or people would come up and say, oh my God, it's Drew Carey because we're right next to the Price is Right, you know, and there's all these people get, wanting to see price shows all day. So naturally you see Drew Carey out at farmer's market. Oh my God, now there's 15, 20, 30 people clamoring around, you know, and uh, every one of them, as he shakes their hand, it's a hundred dollar bill. And uh, he loved it. He loved doing it. The people would light up just like, uh, you know, oh, my God. <laughs> and uh, just generosity in, in two different ways, but both very generous people. It's fantastic. Um, just fantastic stories. You know, uh, it's been, I think, 15 years since Drew came on the show as well. So he's been there for quite a while. He's uh, people know him. You know, there's a new generation now, too, that people know him as the host of The Price is Right, right. as well. And 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 fantastic story thank you for sharing that now i want to shift gears to uh some of your other work i want to start with game show marathon mm. tell me a bit about that tell me about working with ricky lake and i want to know what was it like to work with betty white uh an icon first of all betty white just absolutely amazing for me because again as a game show fan and as a, as a fan of goodson productions and goodson game shows as a kid I mean, I can't tell you how many times I'd see her on on, on things from uh, 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 every Goodson show that they had guests on, you know, like Match Game or Password or any of those shows that had guests. You know, it was, it was so awesome to see Betty White interacting. You know, she's a funny, funny, funny lady. So that was pretty cool. I have a photo with Betty White uh, from Match Game uh, from from. Uh, uh, game show marathon her and i are sit, sitting in her box uh, and uh just a treasure to me I, if you had the time i'd pull it up for you and show you but just really cool stuff i mean ro working with ricky lake ricky was an absolute pro not a lot of people uh during the taping of it were giving her uh much um credit 
or 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 what's the word? They they were looking ahead at how they thought the show was going to do with the audience, and they weren't giving it much of a chance. You know what I mean? This is, this is during taping of them even, and um, I thought she did a fantastic job. And 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 in the end, I thought that the the entire game show marathon series uh, came out uh, splendidly well. I think Fremantle did a great job. You know, they they did Dak and. Uh, they did a version in 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 Britain. Dak, what was the other person's name? Uh, Dak and Ted's game show marathon. So they had previous experience in putting together this long string of seven different game shows, or was it six? I can't remember. Seven, six, and uh, and and making it a a series like that. And it was pretty cool. I think it turned out well. A lot of people still talk about game show marathon. They should do it again. I, I was watching some 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 clips in preparation uh, for this show, you know, and such a cool concept. It was it was a really cool concept to be able to see that. I I, found, I saw that picture of uh, you and Betty White. Um, is, oh. is it okay? If, is it okay uh, while I'm doing the, the editing if I put some of these pictures that we're talking Absolutely. about? Absolutely. Okay I'll, I'll put them in. Um, that people oh, will good. See them. Okay. I'll put them in the, so that people know what we're talking about. I'll, yeah, I'll find them and yeah. put them in. Yeah, you can go to my website and steal anything you want. For sure. Thank you. Sure. Um, I, I want to talk now about, uh, I, I know we're, we're running out of time. I, I gave you some, I give you a time frame, but uh, um, uh, I just want to quickly talk a bit about your time working with Pat Vanna on Wheel of Fortune. What was that like to, to be able to work with two other legends? Yeah, that poster, I noticed that back there. Um, first of all, I came into that situation under, uh, extreme circumstances um i was uh, working in my home studio um we we lived very close to cbs television city that was the reason why we we bought this particular property in beverly hills and i was sitting late at night it was after 10 o'clock and i was back in my studio creating something posting something doing something and um i always used to leave my phone up front so it didn't ring in the studio and and disturbed thing my wife came back knocked on the door and i was like honey i'm, I'm recording she's like uh you need to take this one i i said who is it you know she said uh, it's somebody from sony and i i picked up the phone i said hi it's rich and it was um harry friedman the executive producer of um wheel of fortune and jeopardy who i'd never met in my life i mean i knew him of of him i mean certainly i mean i I, you know, when you're in game shows you, you and, and you want to keep moving in game shows, you just learn as much as you can. And I said, uh, he said, hi, it's Harry Friedman. Uh, uh, Rich, I got your number from your agent, Fred Westbrook. I hope I'm not disturbing you tonight. I know it's late. I said, no, Harry, I'm perplexed. I'm like, why is Harry Friedman calling me not and not my agent? And uh, he says, well, look, I've got some disturbing news. And again, and again, I'm thinking, why is Harry Friedman calling me with disturbing news? He knows nothing about my life. I, I just didn't get, I said, yeah, Harry, go ahead. He goes, um, be kind of a little choked up thinking about it. He said, uh, you know, our announcer, right? I said, well, I've never met him personally, but, uh, he said, well, he passed away today. Uh, I was, oh my God. Um, I said, Charlie O'Donnell, sure, man. I, I, he said he passed away today. I was like, oh, my God. And then it clicked and, you know, is he calling me to to come in? And he says, look, you know, you've been around the game long enough. You know, uh, we're certainly going to be in a grieving period, but we we can't stop production. He says, we're right in the middle of shooting shows. We've got two studios booked, one side's Wheel, one side's Jeopardy. Uh, every, it's millions of dollars to cancel production. He said, um, can you come in and fill in until we figure out what we're doing? And I said, God, yeah, yes, Harry, absolutely. When? He said, tomorrow morning, 8.30. I said, oh, my God. Uh, okay, I, okay, you know, you told me where to be on the Sony lot, blah, 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 and parking spot and all that stuff. And I get there, and it was, uh, Vincenzo, it, they must have had just announced it to the staff that morning because nobody knew the night before. Nobody knew but the family the night before. I walked in and it was like death. It was like in the studio, it was like, 
you could feel this heaviness. It was weird. I mean, from walking outside to walking inside, I don't know if you believe in energy or anything like that. It was, it was, boom. everybody there was like down and they were distressed. They were like, you know, they worked with Charlie for decades and now they just told you he's passed away, but we're working today. We're working today. I mean, it was the weirdest situation to walk into ever. I mean, you know, I, part of me was like, wow, I'm going to get to do wheel. And the other part was like, oh my God, you know, you can, you're walking into Charlie O'Donnell's spot, you know, I get there, Harry Friedman walks me around, you know, introducing me to people. He takes me upstairs to Charlie's dressing room, now completely sanitized of anything Charlie O'Donnell. They had all his stuff down off the walls. It had been cleaned and everything. And and um, he said, look, you know, this is your dressing room. This is Charlie's dressing room, blah, blah, blah. And uh, I started to do some pre-production up there in that dressing room. There, it, was, it was all laid out for like audio recording and voiceover. And once I got done with that, I started looking around the dressing room. I opened up some sliding doors and that poster, that wheel poster, um, unframed and, and not under glass, just a poster board, was in the closet of Charlie O'Donnell's dressing room. And I thought, wow, how cool. What a great memento. And um, I went downstairs with with it in my hand to Harry Friedman. I said, hey, Harry. Hey, Rich, how are you doing? I said, good, good. I said, um, did, did, didn't did you tell me they took all of Charlie's stuff out of the room? He said, yes, they did. It's all boxed up for his family. I said, well, this was left in the... Uh, in one of the sliding closets and it was turned around Vincenzo. So the back was white and the closet was white. And I thought, well, maybe they didn't see it. And so I said, you know, they forgot this. I, I said, was this Charlie's? And he looked at it and he said, wow, that's a, that's a fairly old photo. That's, that's one of our better Vanna Pat and Vanna posters. We did one of our better uh, promotion, promotional things. He said, no, no, that's not Charlie's. I said, can I have it as a memento? Um, let me check with the people in props. If if they say it's okay, I, I, yeah, I'll tell you after lunch. So he told me after lunch, yeah, go ahead, take the poster. So I immediately went across the hall. I'd already met Pat and Ben. I, we'd already cut a show or two for that day. I think we were doing three a days at the time. Maybe more. I can't remember, Vincenzo. I'm sorry, it's been a long time. I've done shows where we did six half hour shows in, in a day. I've I've done prices rights where we do two one hour shows in a day. So they all kind of blend. But I had Pat and Vanna autograph it for me. Uh Van Vanna, I forget what she said. Oh, it says too rich. It was a pleasure meeting you. Love Vanna. And Pat says, Rich, great job, Pat Sajak. So, uh, wheel was a lot of fun. I mean, it, it wasn't, it was nothing like the price is right. I mean, ladies and gentlemen, Pat Sajak and Vanna wide. I mean, it was, it, it had its own kind of read as well. It had its own timber timbre. It had its own cadence and sound. So I wasn't trying to mimic Charlie O'Donnell, but I was trying to give it the same voice, uh, flavor that Charlie gave it. So it was a lot of fun. And, and to hear Pat Sajak, you know, I'm back in my little booth during, during the show and, and Pat's ready and, and rich fields, tell them what they want. I mean, just to hear Pat Sajak say rich fields, tell them what they want. Well, Pat, it's a trip for two, you know, to Barbados, you know, totally unlike Price is Right. You know, Price is Right would have been, it's a trip for two to Barbados, you know, it's just completely different. <laughs> so it was a lot of fun. I did 50, 60 shows with Pat and Vanna. They were they were really cool. Went to Charlie's funeral with Pat and Vanna. Weird. Weird. Surreal. Well, that that's that's, you know, Charlie O'Donnell, another another legend. And that's such a, you know, the story you being able to go in and work with Pat and Vanna, that's just another another legendary show, you know, two, two of the last of the original game show posts on the air, you know, um, out there every night syndicated, you know, uh, it, it'll be different when Pat retires, but it's just so great to be able to have seen this for, you know, 41 years. These, these two have, have had the seven or seven thirty, depending where people are, but most of the time that's around the hour. And, and it's just fantastic, um, to have known that now I just want to quickly ask you, that, that, that mm -hmm. Vanna was, was a contestant on The Price is Right. 
Yeah, yeah. So, and so, she came so back. I had a lower prices right connection. Pat was a weatherman on Los Angeles television like me. So it was kind of cool and weird all at the same time. Just everything's so connected, like you were saying before. That's so that's so cool. That's that's fantastic. Now, quickly before I go, before we wrap up, because uh, I, I, I want to wrap up. I don't want to take too much of your time. Sorry. But uh, but uh, you did some other shows. You guest appeared on other shows, uh, sometimes as yourself on uh, How I Met Your Mother. You you guest starred as yourself. Um, and and I, I want to ask you um, on your website, you say you've been on on you guest appeared on other shows and you said you're on Family Guy. Where did you play on Family Guy? I, I did. A, they called me in. Uh, Seth MacFarlane called me in to do a voice on Family Guy. I was literally. um going to play myself or it was it was a vo for a game show announcer and uh seth when i got into the booth he was like do it just like you do on the price is right i said well people are going to know it's me oh no we we want them to know it's you and i was like oh cool okay great so uh it was something silly i forget what what it was all about but um i got paid i've got the the can't the a picture of the check and I got to put on credits that I work with Seth MacFarlane on, on um, Family Guy. But when the show aired, and I'm sitting there with my wife, we're watching the show. When the show aired, there, there's the lines. And it was the, do, do you know what a talk track is or a VO track? That That's like, that's like a, so the cartoon's going by and somebody with the script is literally just kind of just reading not doing voiceover they're just like you know uh this 1979 you know plymouth convert convertible coupe it was the talk track mm -hmm. they never replaced it with the actual tracks that i did with seth and i recorded with seth for like 15 minutes we did it we did it so many different ways and so he was laughing and he was like can you say like F you like, like rich feels from the price is right. You know, just, just do it. And I'd be like, you know, well, you know, he just, all right, now do this, now do that. Now do that. And he had, he had me do so much. I was shocked in the end that the, the original track, the VO track was not changed out. It was a kind of a letdown, kind of a letdown for me, but uh, I've got, I've got, even got photographs of me in the studio doing the VO uh, at the, uh, at the Family Guy Studios. I mean, it was that's, kind of Yeah, yeah, I, I can imagine. But, you know, that story, thank you for sharing that story. I keep saying thank you for sharing your story because it's, you know, I'm I'm such a fan, you know, of, of all these uh, shows, sure. all the shows, uh, fan of, of you and the work that you've done. So it's, it's really such an honor to have been able to have you here today. Uh, Rich, thank you so much. Um, yeah, there was gentle. so much kind of talked about you know but and i didn't want to take too much time so maybe we'll do it again one day maybe we'll do another absolutely, show it was, absolutely. It was i'm time. happy you bought my book i really appreciate that yeah where can we find your book where can viewers find your book if we want to uh, if they want to buy it it's on amazon uh mm -hmm. the audio version actually if you go to my website richfields.tv www.richfields.tv the audio version is there the hardcover is there the paperback version is there um, the Kindle e-reader version, it's all there, richfields.tv. Um, trust your inner GPS. We, we brushed on it a little bit ago, but, you know, something told me early on, deep inside, I was going to be Bob Barker's announcer and the price is right, something intuitively. And I just I just changed out the word, you know, trust your intuition to trust your inner GPS, because that's really what it is. It's guiding you all the time. If you listen to it, dreams like I had will come true. They will manifest in front of you. Check it out. I'm really proud of this book. And it's all dedicated to Mr. Barker. Uh, it was released just after he passed away. So I had time to change change some of the stuff in the book to reflect Mr. Barker's passing. But um, it was it was a labor of love for me, man. That's for sure. Well, it's such a such a great read. You know, I've uh, I've been flipping through it in preparation for this interview. I've been reading some chapters, some really great stories in here. That, uh, right. certainly, a, lot of, a lot of photos too for your family. Lot photos. Yeah, lots of great photos. A lot of personal photos, backstage stuff nobody's ever seen. It's fantastic. It really is fantastic. So thank you, Rich, so much. Thanks to all the viewers for watching. Pleasure, this. Thank you so much.
it was it was great to have you. Thanks to the viewers for watching. And, uh, and we'll do this again one day. And, and to all the viewers out there, uh, make sure, I hope you enjoyed this this video. And 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 I guess sign off. I'm Vincenzo Calo with Cal Productions. Actually, quickly, Rich, you were the last person to ever say a Mark Goodson television production on television. What was that like? Indeed, I was. Uh, tw twice, I thought. At once in Florida, when I was doing the Florida Lottery's Flamingo Fortune, the end tagline was a Mark Goodson television production. And I thought, wow, I don't think they're even saying that at the Price is Right anymore, because the show had been sold to Pearson and <laughs> and 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 All American, and then Fremantle bought it. And I didn't know if they were still saying it anymore. Then I get to the Price is Right with the announcer job, and Fremantle Media had bought it. And as uh, soon as Mr. Barker retired, boy, they changed that that tagline, a Fremantle media production. But I was the last one to say, a Mark Goodson television production. The the end of an era, you know, one of the greatest game show minds out there. And I like your shirt. Thank you. There's a story behind this shirt. Let's hear it so, real quick. I got 60 I, seconds. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to be really quick. So I was watching a video of, um, of Charles Nelson Riley. He was invited back to Match Game in 1990. And he had a sweater just like this. Yeah. And I saw it. I'm like, that's really cool. I want to find it. And I found a sweater like it online. So I bought it. So super cool. So thank you, Rich, for your time. I'm going to let you go. The Vicala Show is a Vicala production. So until the next video, I'm Vincenzo Cala signing out.